For 20 years, we've been creating innovation in the CX industry. And now we're seeking out brilliant new perspectives on CX you just won't find anywhere else. I'm Richard Owen. Welcome to the CX Iconoclast. I've known Amir Hartman since his days as the founder at Mainstay, which was an outstanding boutique consulting firm. But how the years do seem to fly by. Since then, he had taken responsibility for Oracle's cloud-based customers as the Managing Director of Customer Success for Cloud and AI-enabled value, with responsibility for figuring out exactly how to create value for those customers that are subscribing to all of those technology products. Subsequent to that, he went all in, you might say, on AI technologies. So quite naturally, we talk a lot about artificial intelligence, especially some recent research that he and his colleagues have been doing around AI scaling and some of the things they've learned about what makes AI scale or not, as it turns out, within organizations. But we do take a chance to revisit some of the key lessons from his time at Oracle and how customer success has evolved. Safe to say, we perhaps both agree that it's in need of considerable change to make it an effective function. But his perspective is pretty much on point, I think, for anyone who's thinking of investing in a customer success function or trying to get good value out of it, or for that matter, using AI technologies to enhance customer experience or customer success. I do hope you enjoy our conversation. Amir Hartman, thank you very much for joining us and welcome to the, uh, the Iconoclast. Thanks, Richard. Pleasure to be here. So let's let's dive right in by talking a bit about your time at Oracle. I know you've had you've had a storied career. You've worked at many companies, including some of your own. Um, but I sort of want to go right back to that, which was, I think, at a time when you were responsible for customer value and customer success. Which, first of all, I'm just interested in why those two are worth breaking out as ideas. Um, and, and the thinking whether, whether or not customer value and customer success are really two different things. But that was, um, that was an interesting time there. And Oracle, which is a company which has obviously a huge organization, traditionally an on-prem software company, transitioning to SaaS, what was customer value and customer success at Oracle? That's a good question. Yeah, you know, at the time, um... At the time, it was it tended to be help the customer implement and go live. Uh, that was was one primary function. Um, you know, the customer value piece um, and the sort of the post sales customer success uh, came a bit later, and obviously the realization that um, with cloud and SaaS, it's a heck of a lot easier to to switch. Um, and kind of you pay as you go. So you had better ensure that they're extracting value uh, out of what they just purchased. So I think the, the emphasis on value um, came a little bit later. Uh, it originally, as I said, started to make, let's make sure that they're up and live, implemented and go live and then stabilized uh, was the primary function. And, and frankly, it morphed over time. Every few years, as with many or larger organizations, Every few years, um, it had a different structure. Um, in the beginning, certainly, you had an implementation success team and a customer success team. Um, and that morphed over time uh, and, and is still morphing every couple of years. And again, part of it, I think, a cultural thing. I think uh, Oracle likes to uh, change things up every few years and reorganize. Um, so it's it's gone through a recent uh, reorganization where they've consolidated a number of whether support, education, Oracle University is all consolidated under cust global customer success. But you know the value piece um, to me was to emphasize that at the end of the day, um, what really matters is is the customer extracting tangible value? Is it moving the needle for them in a way that matters to the customer? And so that has a tendency, frankly, to get lost, especially on SaaS providers. You know, you're so focused on heads down and making sure the customer goes live um, and you get very, very tactical. And then so the, to move from that tactical piece to the more strategic piece is a really tricky yeah. tightrope to walk. And a lot of companies struggle with it. 
Yeah, and I, I, I think that's, it's funny you say that, because I think it's very true of SaaS companies that have had a habit of thinking just in terms of live implementation and we switch it on, right? And and look, the, the reality is their investors, the VCs and the PEs, like the idea of switching it on and walking away and collecting subscription. So, Absolutely. you know, that, that's, that's almost been the indoctrination. It's like, why, why are you worried about what they're doing with it? Just focus on getting it live. Oracle coming from a huge tradition of on-prem software, culturally, that had to be a big shift to start thinking in terms of continuous value realization. Absolutely. Uh, and I, I, I don't know if I'd say they're fully there. It's, it's definitely a journey. And I think it's a journey for most organizations that have certainly larger, that have this sort of legacy uh, to deal with. Um, it absolutely it took a number of years to transform and really start thinking about being more customer centric. Um, you know, historically, they've been known. I, I'd say it's safe to say historically, they haven't been known as the most customer centric organization. They are like many, many of the leading Silicon Valley companies. They are a sales machine. They're phenomenal at selling. And you give them, you give the salesperson a product to sell, they can sell. The kind of really thinking about what the customer needs, irrespective of whether it needs me or somebody else, has been a change, uh, a, a bit of a slow change, but definitely moving in that direction. So there's, um, yes, that took a bit of a culture shift, a bit of re-education. Um, and still, they're sort of, again, on that journey. But I think more and more, you're starting to see they, they you know, truly care about, am I moving the needle? Is the company extracting results uh, from my, um, you know, from my solutions? And I think you're, that's why you're starting to see the post-sales piece of it, which, which whereas it's, are, is the customer healthy? Are they fully taking advantage or of adopting the full capabilities of what they purchase? Because the reality of things is, even though they may be live, and this is not Oracle and endemic to Oracle, this is any large SaaS company. Um, if you look at what the, the cu customers truly adopted, they may have gone live and they may have gone live with all the modules that you could possibly can. But the question of are they f leveraging the full potential? Right of the solution. Right. That's another question. That that, um, that that that's that's part of the big problem is figuring figuring out leverage. And it's not just a matter of training or calling them up and saying why aren't you using these modules. You know, you, you look back now because that was some years ago. Technology's advanced a lot. Our thinking's advanced a lot. What's what's different now? I mean, if you if you were doing it today, what would you be doing differently? That's a good question. Um, I think of a couple of things that stand out to me, frankly. Um, you know, we we were trying for a long time and still are, right? They're, they're moving in the right direction. But we, I, th I think two things. Combination of AI and telematics is one thing. I think that the, the ability to embed proper and accurate and insightful tele telematics in the product uh, is absolutely key, and that is no easy feat for a legacy company. Now, you may say it's sort of easy today, um, but to move from kind of an on-prem scenario where you have very little telematics uh, to the kinds of insight a customer truly needs, you know, what am I using, how much am I using it, um, what's uh, optimized, what's not optimized, um, those and, and even the more important questions, like okay, if I've got your um, your supply chain solution, can I tell how mu how much my inventory is, how many inventory turns, for example, the kind or, or how how quickly am I closing the books? So those kinds of telematics, I w if I could go back, I wish I could start there. Is really make the product much more intelligent. Um, and the combination of telematics and, and, and AI and, and is, could be very, very powerful, number one. Um, I think the, the other thing is I would start much sooner. I, I, obviously, hindsight's twenty twenty, but I think the, the, this issue of value extraction and value realization 
um, I would have started it much, much earlier. Um, I think the, obviously the, at the time, the focus was, can we, can you get on-prem companies and transition them uh, over to the cloud? Um, and that was the focus, you know, and, and so I think those two things probably stand out in my mind. I think the thing, if you see now, obviously, I think there's a lot of cost pressures, especially for large enterprise SaaS providers, lar very significant cost pressures. And customer success is not cheap. Right? Right. Right. Initially, they started right. out with, you know, it's a headcount, it was a headcount driven yep. function. Um, and so they're, it's very, very heavy from a cost standpoint. So now they're now they're trying to figure out how can we re-engineer things so that I've got a portfolio of let's say customer success capabilities where let's say a certain portion I can have self-service, a certain a certain portion I can has make digital CS digital customer success, and a certain portion um, is more for that one-to-one -one, uh, person to person uh, engagement. And I think though, that's where things are right now is, is how can I create that portfolio where I don't just have to have more headcount, but I can scale what's truly important right. customer success in a, in a different way. Well, and, and there's, you know, I think if you look at the evolution of that solution, in the earliest days when it got started, we were in a period of extraordinarily cheap capital and a lot of Less so with a company that scales at Oracle, because Oracle's accountable to a, uh, the public in terms of the yep. P&L. But venture-backed companies had an extraordinary amount of capital, were less concerned, frankly, with efficiency, weren't terribly concerned with bottom line P&L. It was growth at all, at, all, at all costs. And customer success looked like a really simple strategy. Throw a bunch of people at the problem. And if you move net revenue retention, then that's a win. And so, you know, damn the torpedoes, let's basically just put people on the problem. Yeah. And there was less of a focus, as you said, on automation, segmentation. It wasn't even obvious that a lot of time was spent thinking about what the exact parameters of the role were. It was literally, it'll be great to have humans calling customers, and somehow that's going to help things along. I think that that's a rather unique set of circumstances because you don't normally get industries with that kind of funding to do things. And I think it didn't exist much outside, outside this, this, uh, this almost bubble of capital. I mean, I love the idea you're saying that to some extent segmentation is part of the solution, but also is, isn't the goal to work on the things in an enterprise model which eliminate or reduce the need for customer success? I mean, to some extent, it's, there's a little bit of the boy with his finger in the dike problem here, isn't there? Absolutely. I think it's a great, and frankly, the in my last couple of years at Oracle, that was really the intent is can we create, that's, there was so much of an emphasis on digital CS with, I guess, the unsaid vision of can we put CS out of work? That was really the, the driving yeah. vision. Uh, so absolutely. I, I completely agree. And I think that's still there. Not. Uh, not that it's not important, but there are ways to get things done. There are ways to provide the customer what it truly needs. But when you think about it, let's take a step back. If you think about it, and I, this is from my experience, but I know that there was a recent Bain survey that was done. Customers really are looking for a couple of big things, big ticket items. They're looking for make, help me make sure I go live and implement this effectively, right? And then, and then stabilized. They definitely want help there. Um, and then there's make sure I'm getting my money's worth. Let me make sure I'm getting value for what I paid for. If you look at the CS activities that are normally done and you sort of line them up in terms of, you know, here are the 20, 30 activities that, that are done in CS or a customer success manager does, there's a lot of non-value add activities, things that we think are important. Take for example, the dreaded customer success plan. I'd say every every organization has a CS plan, customer success plan or success plan. If you ask customers if they see that as being value, the majority will tell you no. 
they don't. It's a waste of time. It's uh, it's uh, you know, sort of talking points that we like to hear from you know that the that the provider likes to put on the table. The QBR, the dreaded QBR, again is another one that's a big question mark. So, yeah, I I think um, absolutely that is definitely. Mm-hmm. I think it's a healthy thing to do is can we put ourselves out of business? What is it that we can deliver that's truly of value to the customer? Um, and when, what things can we do away with or we really rethink? Well, I, I'd argue that part of it is being more thoughtful about what gets sold, right? Let's start with, let's start with that. Uh, being more thoughtful about whether the products actually meet the requirements of customers as opposed to need to be stretched and beaten up so that they can actually do something and Absolutely. then you know the um you know then then to some extent you're taking the weight out of the downstream and then being much more customer knowledgeable about how you target customers with the resources and help they need to be successful as opposed to being sort of this peanut butter spread idea okay we'll just allocate people across um across people i i I could talk about this a long time, but I'd love us to switch topics for a second. You I will say, I let, know- me, let me just interject oh. here, because you brought something up that I think is really important. And it's amazing to me, to, to your point about, you know, kind of easing up uh, and giving the customer what it wants on one hand, and then having the CS folks and even sales folks really reallocate attention to what truly matters, understanding what the customer needs. It is amazing to me. I, mean, I had to, I, I, I had to train a, probably about 500 customer success managers on how to engage with with customers um, and different sort of personas. Right? You, you don't want to have a discussion with a CFO the same way you do with a CIO, for example. It is amazing to me how si- simple things that we don't do for to to get visibility and understand the customer. So for example, let's just say you're dealing with a publicly traded customer. There is so much information out there that can be useful to a customer success pan- manager, let alone a salesperson in terms of you know what they're experiencing, what their competitions like, what their financials are like. And to to and and think about now now with AI you can simply load up for example yeah. a a 10k or a 10q into an AI model and have it spit back to you you know depending on how effective you are at prompting and asking it some very insightful information about the customer and how to how to have a dialogue with the customer that's going to resonate these are things that are so simple to do yet. Are not necessarily being done. It's certainly not being done right. um, in, in commonplace. I'm sure there are leading companies that do this. Well, I think um, we're trying to. I think we're trying to do almost remedial processes, and we're losing sight of. You know, we want to build sort of ritual and process of. I'm calling the customer X number of times. Yeah, I'm asking them the same thing X number of times, as right. opposed to strategize, which is much harder. And you know, all I can say is, look, if you can get synth- AI synthesis of. 10 cues, then, then thank God, because actually reading those things is absolutely impossible. They're, yeah. they're miserable documents to read. So on, on the AI topic, I know that recently you and your partners in the uh, Experience Alliance, you, know, you guys published a study here, some research around current state of the use of AI in CX. I think it was quite a comprehensive study, 171 companies. So Love to have you talk about what the sort of top level findings were from the um, from the study. Yeah, it's it's an ongoing study, but we uh, we published uh, recently just a kind of interim results, um, and I, I'd say probably the few things that stand out um, is certainly. I mean, I think things that we probably you know we, we probably know already. The, the sentiment for AI is quite positive, so you're getting a, over eighty eighty five percent of senior CX leaders are very positive with respect to the potential of AI to, to transform their, their company, to transform the industry. That was one uh, obvious one. Uh, the, the interesting insights beyond that are when you start looking, and I'd say, I'd say the vast majority of them, about 80 plus percent are experimenting. Right. right. So that was, that was one. The interesting insight beyond that was if you look at, if you ask the question, how many companies are actually 
deploying AI at scale, that's a very different question. There we got a much lower percentage. There we got about 15% or less. That was number. That was a big uh, finding. I think the other finding was around what I would call AI literacy. Um, and that was actually a surprising finding um, and a bit troubling. So the finding was, again, on one hand, we have 85% very strong sentiment for AI. Less than 25% actually have a, a programmatic AI literacy program in their organization. That, to me, was very surprising and frustrating at the same time. It's almost, to me, a, a leadership failure, I have to say. It's, it's an ethical problem, in my opinion. On one hand, you've got leadership excited about the potential of AI, yet there, less than 25% of them are actually empowering or upskilling their people. Uh, with respect to AI. That, to me, was quite surprising and troubling. Um, so I think those are, are probably the, the biggest findings. Um, certainly, the other finding, I think, it, despite the experimentation, again, I, I, I call it um, sort of pilot paralysis, right? They, you know, they, 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 everybody's experimenting and in pilot mode, um, but uh, they're, they're kind of stuck in that pilot mode. Right? Yeah. They're, 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 yeah. they're, there's challenges extracting yourself from pilot saying yay or nay and truly deploying it at scale. Um, I think that's, those are some, some of the top line findings. So there's, there's a lot of data and we've, uh, we were, uh, one of the previous episodes of this series, we were talking to um, Bob Cooper has done a lot of research around um, the application of artificial intelligence of failure rates in projects. One of the most striking things is how high the failure rates are. Now, you could argue that in almost every generation of technology, this is very common. I do wonder whether or not, I'd love your reaction to this idea. So artificial intelligence, similar to every wave of technology, to some extent, starts with Silicon Valley persuading companies that they have this new set of brilliant ideas that in of themselves are going to solve every possible business problem. And the hype cycle gets into full gear. Absolutely. Companies under some degree of pressure start to afford sandbox money to doing things. And they go off and there's, of course, a large internal incentive to do this because people want to get it on their resumes. They want to enhance their career by saying, well, I worked on AI projects. And so all this sandbox money gets spread around, often on projects which are either ill-conceived low probability of success uh, based on the presumption that companies are going to develop talent and expertise that's very unlikely they're ever going to be able to build. And the result is a tremendous amount of failure. And this is kind of the sandbox phase. And then every wave of technology moves beyond that because to some extent, vendors come in and codify all the useful solutions. If it was marketing automation, it was sales automation, Correct. out of the box because then we've got some convergence with standards and applicability. Sounds to me like we're still in that phase where the sandbox money is being spent and what, nothing's coming out of the sandbox because these are just bad ideas, bad sandbox projects or, or hard to execute sandbox projects. Yeah, I, I, I'd, say, um, I'd say there's a lot of truth to that. I mean, obviously the, the, the pilots and the sandboxes, easy to get, you know, vendor, any vendor, uh, We'll, we'll give you, you know, free pilots uh, or pilots of very little cost. Um, so the pilots are easy to do, but th you're right. There's a, a bit of an issue. I mean, some of them may be ill-conceived. I think there's certainly a bit of that. But I think more, perhaps even more than that, if I look at the portfolio of how people are allocating their, their attention, right, their capital and their talent to these projects, it's what I would call, 90% of it is what I would call kind of running the business, kind of keeping the lights on. Really smart things to do, you know, content marketing, things, you know, not, I'm not, not putting a judgment on these. They're smart things to do. They're just not going to move the needle as far as competitive advantage. Right. So 90% of the portfolio of these projects is what I would call, like I said, run the business or keep the lights on type of activities. Smart things to do should be done. Um, the question is, when you start looking at different kinds of different parts of the portfolio, 
am I, do I have investments that are going to move the needle to improve margin, for example, or really grow the top line or innovate, truly innovate yeah. the business? The, they are very, it's very few and far between. In fact, in the innovate side, I see almost close to zero in, 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 in most companies. Yeah, um, and that, so that's much that's, harder, right? And, and that, that is, that's the hard part. I think Goldman Sachs, uh, actually, was, uh, Goldman Sachs and Sequoia both published reports on this perceived AI gap, and they were doing computation based on how much capital is being pushed into AI and how much revenue is being generated on the other end. And there's a, there's a terrifying gap. You know, the presumption of the amount of capital going in implies that companies are going to have to spend way, way more on AI to make that capital pay off. Now, if you look at the revenue associated with AI, big chunk of it is open AI. Chat GPT Absolutely. is a huge chunk of revenue. Uh, outside that, the revenues haven't shown up, which means that companies aren't yet deploying AI. And I wonder how much large language models and obviously Chat GPT in particular, because of its elegance and its simplicity and its almost fun factor, Yes, have captured too much of the imagination around artificial intelligence. And everybody is trying it. And I actually wonder whether or not in the long term we'll see chat GPT run into trouble as people, you know, go from this is cheap and fun and we'll try it to this is really something that's worth sustaining spending money on. Have, have LLMs just, they've captured our imagination, but have they in some ways distracted us from the more interesting problems we should be solving? Yeah, look, I, I I agree. I think there's a lot of uh, a lot of truth to what you said there. I mean, I think the we it has captured a lot of the imagination, and the attention has definitely shifted toward that very sexy um, sort of interface, and, and 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 rightfully so. Don't get me wrong. I mean, there's there's this. It's I totally understand it, right? Uh, but if you look at what I mean, AI is certainly not new. It's been around for decades. Some of the very powerful Powerful AI uh, is stuff that's not simple to do, like like ChatGPT. Right? It's you know it's taking, for example, you know physical assets like windmills and, and and HVACs, for example, and making them smarter through things like IoT and that combination of AI and visual AI and IoT and you know sensors, making these products smart. For example, that's where some really powerful things in, uh, exist. And I think I would encourage folks with any industry to really start looking at can we embed ai in our products that's where some really powerful things happen you know that being said i think there's a little bit of my what i would call a, a bit of an impatience on on the part of uh you know top line value and value creation with respect to ai i mean take for example how many war stories have you experienced or heard uh, let's take ERP. ERP is established, I mean, a core core technology for many businesses. But how many war stories have you heard of five, six, seven year implementations that cost hundreds of million dollars? And the question is, does it even pay back the cost of capital? Right. Right. Now, now all of a sudden, because of because of uh, ChatGPT, our patience is is so short. We expect it to deliver measurable value on the top line instantaneously. I mean, we've been, what, two years? It's two years? Well, I'd, I'd, I'd like to think we'd learned from the errors in the past. And, uh, you know, we're, we're expect, our expectations are adjusted to the, the problem with those old implementations wasn't so much they were slow to pay back, but they cost too much relative to the potential payback, which seems to be happening again with AI. You can absolutely make an argument that it needs more time. And we know we're in the first innings here. Yeah. But I think Sequoia's point is, do we run up such a debt in the first inning that it's simply inconceivable this makes sense, you know, given, given the, 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 the amount of capital put into it, to, for it for it to ever sort of pay back? You know, you can discount these things at some point. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, which, which could be just the most analytic way of looking at any hype cycle. It was probably true when it came to the web. It was probably true when it right. came to you know, RDBMS technologies in the, in the, in the 1990s, we're, we're just, the hype cycle means a huge amount of capital chasing. Absolutely. Disappointing Absolutely. Certainly, certainly for the language models, for sure. But I think for, for your enterprise customer, 
that's where I think the leadership challenge is, in my opinion, mm -hmm. is how do we, because I'm, I'm not an advocate of, you know, we, we did see a little bit of sort of wait and see in, in, in our study. Yeah. Um, I'm not a big advocate of that. Uh, yeah, why do you think there was so much wait and see? You, you pointed yeah, out I think in the part study. Of it was, you know, certain industries kind of lend themselves. I think there's definitely, to your point, there's definitely some, uh, you know, there's, there's been some reports around what's the payback, you know, the sort of question mark around payback. So they're pulling back the reins a little bit. But I think the for enterprise leaders, the challenge is this balancing act, this walking the tightrope between how do I experiment um, and learn? Because we're all learning, uh, and 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 you know, and and not be and not invest so much that I'm being dilutive with respect to the all the AI activities, right? So it's, it's, I, there's a need to learn and experiment and see what really sticks and moves the needle. Uh, that's the that to me is the tightrope where leaders kind of earn their keep, which is. How do I walk that tightrope? Yeah. Because it's not simple, right? It, 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 to, to say I'm going to see how things play out and wait, for example, for you know uh, all the enterprise SaaS providers to em embed AI in their solutions, with, which they all are, and kind of really seeing what sticks. Um, I, I'm not sure that's the that's the best approach. Um, Certainly, again, the oracles and the the, uh, the sales forces, they're all embedding AI in their solutions. Or, or at least um, claiming to. Yeah. Or they'll, they'll, or they'll rebrand all the products AI. So Right. <laughs> right. So you know, that's why I think that's, that's where the, the leader earns their keep is being able to walk that tightrope. Because you can, obviously, you can't just go all in uh, and say, we're all AI first. And we're gonna everything, you know, every function, we're, we're everything has to have an AI strategy. Uh, I, I think that's that's a, a, a I think that's a, a great thing framing. to do, but to, to be blindly um, doing it is perhaps a bit um, a, a bit too aggressive. Then and then taking that sort of back, see, I'm gonna wait and see how this thing plays out. I think is very dangerous. Now, I, I love your framing of that. Look, the, the idea that ultimately leadership's job is to figure out how to walk, the, walk that tightrope, right? And the, the the two failing strategies are, on one hand, always be a laggard. Wait until everything's proven the late adopters. Unless you're in an industry where you have massive natural advantage for some reason, or your competition is even worse. Um, you know, and, and you think you can get away with that, but right. most of the turnover in the S and P 500 and companies that get put out of business are the ones that missed the wave and either they made the wrong choices or they made no choice. At the end of the day, making no choice almost guaranteed to fail you. On the flip side, to your point, getting so far out in front of these things, um, seems foolhardy and expensive. And in fact, doesn't necessarily teach you much because you're right. you're simply wasting opportunity. You're misallocating resources. So the, f the way you framed it, which was that where the leadership earns its keep, is striking that balance. And that's look. Wouldn't you argue that's been the case for digital transformation initiatives, moving companies onto the web? You know, this is every innovation in technology requires this this leadership equation to be figured out and executed, and separates the winners and losers. Absolutely. Yeah, totally agree. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's going to be fascinating to watch. You know, I think, um, you know, definitely the, the, the space is very, you know, it's very exciting. It moves very rapidly. I mean, even for, for, for us, I mean, I, I find just myself keeping up with, with things, with new emerging yeah. capabilities. It's not easy. It's, 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 it's you, and, and, and there's so much out there. That's the trouble. Right? The, the I, th I think the, you can agree it's the fastest wave as well. Don't, don't you think, I mean, you know, we're not spring chickens here, so we can say we've seen, you know, we've yeah. seen a couple of, seen a couple of these waves, but this one feels the pace is incredible. And I think credit to Microsoft and Google and Amazon and these companies, I mean, they have moved incredibly fast in innovating. Um, you know, the big companies, you always expect the startups to pile in and do new things. Correct. But the large enterprise players have done an amazing job. And, and that's meant that it's, it, it takes your breath away how fast things have moved. 
Um, I think those large companies learned a different lesson from the past. They learned that they can't wait and fall behind. Absolutely. And that they need to get in front of it. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. And they've not I mean, been afraid Oracle's of a great, great example. I think Oracle, you know, you certainly say that uh, they were a little bit slow on, on, on the cloud side. Um, but yeah. they've, I think their approach to AI is, is quite a good approach. I mean, they're, they're placing a number of bets, both on the infrastructure side and the application side. Um, so yeah, I, I totally agree. They definitely learned the lesson. It's very quite impressive to watch these larger established players move so quickly. I mean, that's probably a great place for us to end. I mean, I, I, we could talk about this a lot longer, both these topics, I think covering the origin of customer success is an interesting topic in its own right. And, and what's been going on in AI is fascinating. Um, so maybe, maybe we need to have a round two, because either one of those two, I think would, would be worthy of a, a, a deeper conversation. Agreed, uh, agreed. Thank you very, very much. We thoroughly enjoyed talking to you about this, and we really appreciate your time and, um, and your insights. Thank you, Amir. Absolutely. Thanks, Richard. We'll see you soon. Thanks for listening to the CX Iconoclast from OCX Cognition. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts so you won't miss any of our thought-provoking conversations. And please get in touch if you want to learn more about what OCX Cognition's predictive CX analytics platform can do for your business by providing complete insights into every account, continuously updated and connected to operations. You'll find contact info in the show notes.